Historically, there have been three different ways that clients can bring on a contractor or engage with the contractor for their projects. And in this conversation, we're really talking about single family residences and that kind of building type. Um, the first is a negotiated agreement. The second is competitive bidding. And the third is design build, which is a different form of agreement with the contractor. There is actually a fourth one, um, which is called pre-construction. And pre-construction is something that we advocate for as what we prefer in our practice. And it's a, it's a way of engaging a contractor that has become much more common probably within the last decade and has several benefits to it. Um, but in this recording, we're going to talk about each of these uh, four ways to engage a contractor, uh, the process that takes place, uh, what do we, uh, the architect, do in each of these different methods, and the pros and cons of each of them. The negotiated agreement, as it sounds, you're basically negotiating uh, the price of hiring a contractor, yeah. right? So I would say maybe typically, you know, somebody rec recommended a contractor. It could be us, the architect, who you know suggested a few names, and you you, you pick one of them. It could be your neighbors, it could be your family, it could be your friends who used the guy who was great. You know, it was affordable, did a good job. Therefore, you want to go with that person. Yeah, yeah. And the bi the biggest difference with negotiated agreement versus competitive bidding is that. In a negotiated agreement method, it means that you're only speaking with one contractor. Yes, which in a way could make your life easier because you don't yeah. have to reach out to a bunch, you know, follow up, hear back, discuss or whatever. You just go to one guy and you're just trying to lock him in or or lock her in, depending on, you know, if it's a female contractor or not. But the the one thing with going just to this one specific person is that I think sometimes clients don't think about the fact that, well, is it the best person for the project I'm trying to do? Sure. You know, there is a, as we talked about on other episodes, there is a lot of different types of contractor who do a lot of different kinds of work, right? So- And a lot of different ways to, to, to decide if they're the best fit or not. Yeah. yeah. So if you go to that one person, you're kind of limiting your, your choices and, mm -hmm. and this person might or might not be uh, the best contractor for the project. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is that, well, to negotiate the number, which usually you negotiate it down because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you sure. never negotiate yeah, up yeah, yeah. to hire a contractor, <laughs> right? I think it's important to understand how they came up with the number they gave you mm. and how could we negotiate that number down, right? Yeah. Um, you know, being transparent about getting the number and what is included in that number is very important. You don't want someone to just show up to your house, look around and give you like a whatever number they're just thinking of, you know, to get the job. Like that's not, that's not thorough. That's not explaining what yeah. is included, what is not included. Yeah. Um, so just for full transparency, it makes sense to, you know, you go to the dentist and you're going to get a bunch of implants. Well, you want to know how much it's going to cost and what is included in that cost. Yeah. You buy a car, you want to know what options you're getting for that price. Same thing. Yeah. Right? Transparency when it comes to bids or construction costs and the contractor's costs are are essential. They're very, very important. Um, I don't think, well, I know, I've never worked with a contractor who was very good or even decent who did not provide full transparency um, demonstrating where the client's money is going. So for anyone who's like brand new to design and construction, all of this stuff, typically um, a contractor's fee will most often be a percentage, sorry, their, their profit will be a percentage of the materials and labors and the, the cost, the raw cost to build the house, right? So, and what they submit when it's a bid or, or a cost estimate is a very, very detailed breakdown of again, where the money is going, what, how much wood, how much is being spent on the wood, how much is being spent on the foundations, how much is being spent on the concrete, how much is being spent on the the labor, on on the items, the 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 different things that go into the property or into the house. So, as a client, you should really expect to see that basically Excel sheet format that lists of every single thing, so you know where it's going. Um, if you don't have that, then that is a, a major red flag. And that's a red flag and, and you know we've worked with contractors who are small like they have a, a small team of a few people mm -hmm. and one could say that well you know it takes like to have you know how many people in the office to like run those numbers do the spreadsheet with like very detailed estimates any even small contractor who's organized and thorough would do that yeah. because that's how you run a business you need to know like how much money comes in how much money comes out what goes to where so they can't just come up with a number and a guy who would come up with a number without giving you any details of how that number uh, has been established 
Uh, I it, would not it, trust them. What, what it means is that they didn't do the calculation. No. And that's a scary thing. So a, a lot of what the whole architecture design and construction process is about and how to achieve success with it, and therefore a successful home, is about being thorough and detailed and spending a certain amount of time and sometimes money kind of upfront to plan for the future, to save time and money later on. And thoroughness is a big part of that that equation. So yeah, if a contractor is giving you a number and they've not, they don't give a detailed breakdown, they don't have a breakdown, which means therefore later on in the project, if something takes place, like you're not happy with X item or things are getting too expensive or you want to swap something out, you have no idea the cost implications. You're just going to have to trust whatever they say. And anyone's been through this process before knows that something like that will happen. And if you don't understand again where, what you're what what you're spending uh, on, uh, it it just doesn't it just doesn't work. Yeah, or you know maybe the number is low at the beginning, but it's not including a whole bunch of stuff, and then you get a bad surprise someday that well, guess what? It's doubled because half of it was not part of it. So it's good yes. to understand like how is the number like put together to then negotiate it, right? Like. Well, do you have to reduce the scope? Do you have to change that arch door to be a square door? Because, you know, it costs more money. Therefore, you can make that, you know, overall number closer to what your budget is. Is it that his labor is very expensive because he's getting his, his construction guys from like two towns over and it takes them three hours to come to your site? Is it because his profit margin is like 50% the price of the construction? Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's crazy. That's, you know, that that's, that's crazy, right? Um, so I think just transparency, if, if as you know, it's also, an, you're kind of negotiating a relationship too, in a way, right? So you want trust, you want to be able to talk numbers comfortably. Mm -hmm. You you want the person who's going to do the job to be happy with the numbers that they're getting for the job that they want to do. You don't sure. want them to take a cut on their paycheck. That's not cool. And you want to make sure that you're going to get what you, what you want. The second way of hiring somebody, uh, hiring a contractor, is competitive bidding, and um, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. In that, instead of just going to one contractor and just and saying that's going to be the one, you bid the project out to multiple contractors, and then you get their bids and you choose the one that's that's you choose the right contractor based on obviously their price, but also other things like whether or not you get along with them, their experience, their expertise. Uh, if they if they work well with the architects, all those other stuff is involved too. But in this case, it's 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 a competition, right? And usually, the amount of bids that we'll get for a project if we go this route is at, at a minimum three. Like three makes sense, and sometimes it's more than that. But tell us what happens in the process, and what do we do throughout a competitive bidding process? So what we do is we, we basically start designing the project and we get it to a good place where we have what we call like a, a bidding set, which is a, a design set that is very detailed. Like there is a lot of drawings to kind of depict everything that's happening in the project, calling out materials, specifications of, you know, windows, finishes and things like that. Um, sometimes you even go to the point where you actually get into either close to construction documents or within construction documents. You're really like laying out like the full project like out on the table with every single pieces that you know would yeah. be part of it. Yeah. For someone to kind of like look at it all in detail and price out every single thing that's in that set. Yeah. So what this means is that in a competitive bidding um, approach, that you're not engaging the contractors until very late into the process, yeah, maybe a process. year into the process. So historically, what happens is the architect does the designing, like you said. A lot of times, we have also uh, submitted the permit drawings to the building department, and we've gotten our permits, even. And uh, yeah, in some cases, we have full construction documents, which detail everything. And like I said, that could be, um, for a large house, that could be a year's worth of work before you have a contractor looking at the drawings. And the reason why that drawing set, the pricing set, or whatever you call it, needs to be detailed is because in a competitive bidding process, the idea is that when you get these bids, that's the number. And yeah, it'll vary a little bit because there's always you know, unknown things that kind of pop up during construction that need to be rectified and whatever. But aside from the unknowns, the numbers you get is meant to be the number. So the document set, the drawing set, the document set that's sent to these contractors for them to price has to be very, very thorough. It's not meant to be like a, a working session. It's it's this is the house we're building. Tell us tell us how much is you're going to charge us to build it. That's that's what it means.
And the way the process typically works is that you either like the client or us, the architect, will reach out to, you know, like three, four or five contractors and basically invite them to bid on the project, mm -hmm. right? Um, we then send the, the bidding set to each of them when the set is ready and tell them, okay, guys, we have, you know, two weeks to get your bid. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, you can email us any questions. If you want to even go to the site, we can organize a tour of the property, if it's a remodel or like, you know, like just the land, if it's just a, a plot of land that, that's waiting to get a house built on it. Mm -hmm. And all of the bidders are invited to those uh, site visits. Mm -hmm. So they each get, you know, the same information. Uh, and it's actually a very important time because in a way, during this time, a lot of questions coming from them can inform the design for you know for like later on. Yeah. Um, so those are are usually pretty good questions, or they already you can kind of already tell like the way they're thinking about things. You know, like some of them already start making suggestions, mm -hmm. or be like, hey, can we price out an alternate option for the things we're trying to do here? Because maybe we could save some money there. Um, you know, and that's totally fine. So they have two weeks to kind of really scrutinize all the drawings. You know, like brainstorm all the questions that they have, all the things that maybe is not on the drawings that they need in order to put the numbers together. Once it's the deadline, mm -hmm. everybody has to submit their bid, you know, usually back to the architect, sometimes back to the clients at a certain date and time. After that time, you're you're allowed to reject them because, you know, the, 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 the rules, it's really yeah. a competition, right? You have yeah. to, to follow the rules in order to make it in. Yeah, um, I, I want to pick up on that point. It's a very official process to go through. It has to be because you want to be able to, to fairly compare these different people. Yeah. So the 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 site visits and the questions they ask, all the information gets is kind of like going to court. It's shared amongst all the competitors, so they, it's an equal playing field. Yeah. The other point I want to bring up, based on what you said, is that um, you know clients wonder what what is the architect? What do we do? We what does we the architect do throughout this process? we essentially act as your agent and advisor and your representative. So in most cases for us, we will suggest, um, I don't like suggesting multiple contractors because I don't like pitching our contractors against each other, but we'll suggest at least one contractor and we will be there to facilitate, f facilitate all the process you mentioned, but also to vet them, which brings us to the interviewing process. Yeah, so once we get all the bids in, you know, it takes us some time to kind of like review them and then we would organize a series of basically interviews and mm -hmm. the client could be part of it or choose not to be part of it, it's really up to them. Um, and then we sit down with each of the bidders and kind of go over their bid and ask, you know, a few more detailed questions like, well, you know, like where is your, I don't know, cabinet supplier shop is it possible for us to go visit are you providing you know how many samples are you providing are mm -hmm. you protecting your cabinets after they being installed on site because other guys like other trades are going to do work so yeah. you know if you have questions about numbers that seems a bit off or maybe very different from the other bidders there might be something there that needs to be understood so now is the time to ask mm -hmm. um it could also be other things like, do you have any referrals? Is there any project that we can go see? Um, you know, like what is not included in your in your scope of work in your in yeah. your in your bidding. That, those these interviews are, are they're not fast con and short conversations. They're very detailed because again, we're going to spend probably millions of dollars on this thing, and we want to know in great detail what what they've priced. And also, it's a chance for us to understand how they're going to work because us and the contractor. It's very important for the client to get along with the contractor because they're gonna, you're going to interact with them for very stressful things for the next few years. But it's all, frankly equally important that the architect and contractor get along with each other because those are the professionals that have to work with each other. So the interviews are also an opportunity for us to kind of uh, test them, test the relationship in that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember interviewing a, a bidder for a project I was working on and the guy steps in the room, he looks at me and he's like, oh, well, you don't look like an architect. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I don't think you're Ding. studying well here. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it, it is super important. And I, and also that's why I think you want to have at least three bidders or more is to have a frame of reference for each of their numbers. Um, if you only have one or two guys, when one could be really low, one could be really high, you don't really know. But if you have like three to five, it's pretty clear if everybody's about the same you know, the same estimation for this item, then yeah. they're probably right, you know? Yeah, and I do. If yeah. it's like double, then okay, maybe something's off here. Well, I do want to talk about that aspect, but so what happens if the bids come back and all of them are just too high for you, the client? 
right? Then you have three options. You don't move forward with the project. You bid it out to different contractors, or you alter the project to bring the cost down. You change the scope. You change the scope. But as you kind of implied, let's say you've bid it out to three, maybe even more than that contractors, and they're all high, there's a good chance that to accurately bring the number down in a way that's going to be make sense and have success in the project, it means that you have to reduce the scope or reduce something in it and not just bid it out to more people. So those are your options. Um, again, I do want to reemphasize that you should rely heavily on your architect or if we're working with you, with uh, uh, we rely on us to help with this process because I think from a client standpoint, the most you can, the most, the only criteria you really have to judge a contractor is based on their previous work, right? But also, I don't know many clients who can visit a job site or a, a finished house and actually understand what they're looking at in terms of whether it's clean right. or not. Like I've seen a lot of clients go through houses and say, wow, this is really nicely done. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. These well, are because they really get distracted with the, you know, the big rooms, the tall ceilings, exactly. the giant windows. But then if exactly. you look at it a bit closely, it's like, well, this is that is kind of funky. The precision of the cut here is not that great. Yep. The grain here doesn't match. Like, come on. So know. I guess one one word of advice on that is if you're if 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 you're looking at a contractor's work, you look at all the joints. The joints are the easiest way to see whether or not their work is clean. Well, when you go with your architect, so you know, <laughs> we true. can look at the stuff and tell but, you. <laughs> So clients have that. Clients have that relationship aspect, just whether or not they get along with them, which does count account for a lot. Um, and uh, they have also whether or not it's been recommended by friends. But again, it goes back to the point of do your friends actually know whether or not what high high quality construction is? And then there's the number. So really, in a way, it's just the number and whether or not you like them. But the the full criteria and the majority of the criteria or a lot of it for determining whether or not the contractor is right for this project falls outside of those things so that's a long way of saying that it is very very important that you use your architect if you have one on board which you should to to be part of this process um it, it just makes sense now the clearly the benefits of competitive bidding is that as a client i get to see a bunch of numbers and i get to understand why they're high and low and choose the one that's potentially the lowest or the fairest there's many, many downsides to competitive bidding, which is why we do not like doing it in the way we've described, you know, historically. The first one is that if you take a step back, and again, competitive bidding is the way it's been done, the majority of like the history, the history of like architecture, right? If you take a step back, it really makes no sense that you would work closely with an architect and interior designer and designer, whoever else, for like a full year spend tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars on them to design this idealistic, perfect dream home, yep. not have any idea how much it's going to cost, and then send it out to contractors and say, oh, tell me how much it's going to cost. Yep. I can I guarantee there's like a 99.99% .99 chance that those numbers are going to come back too high, but not only too high, like significantly too high. Well, that and also like you, you're also asking a, a group of strangers to look at a pretty, usually a pretty hefty drawing set in detail of something they've never seen before. Yep. They're only looking at it in 2D, like they probably don't even have a 3D model to look at to understand the project. Mm -hmm. They might have gone to the site, might not have gone to the site. Mm -hmm. And you're asking them within two weeks to come up with like all of those very precise numbers and information, oftentimes for free. Yes, this is this is one aspect and, of being a and, contractor and, I don't envy. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so if the guy really wants the job and he's willing to spend that much time and do all that work up front for free to get it. It's tough. It's tough for them. It's tough. It's part because, of the game. Because you're doing it for free. Well, you don't want to spend too much time looking at those drawings because this is like free time. And and you also want the job, so you might just lowball it. Or you're a very thorough guy. You're probably going to spend some time looking at it. But you're probably going to be too high because you're actually pretty thorough and you want to be accurate. So you might not get the job. The you know that that that's a, that's the the second point and probably the one of the more, more important ones is that the bids you get back, it's almost impossible for them to be um, uh, fairly uh, comparable 
and, and accurate with each other. The bids will be high and low, not just based on uh, this guy's actually just higher and that person's actually just lower. Not just that, it's that their bidding methods are not the same. Like the the set that you send out to them, that we send out the drawing set, the pricing set, could be 100 pages. I mean, if you imagine large format, 24 by 36, 30 by 40, or whatever size drawings, 100 pages for someone to go through, it's a lot of information. And almost in every instance, the if you have someone who bids on the project and they're low by a sizable amount, that means they weren't thorough in their review of the document set. Almost guaranteed that's the case. Almost guaranteed. Or there is not enough information on the drawings for them to accurately price it. So their bid is inaccurate either way, though. Right. Right. And almost guaranteed that the person who's highest, they will probably be the one that's the most accurate and thorough in their bidding and the reviewing of the documents and their bid. Very, very good chance. Now, and of course, it depends on the contractors you're, you're getting bids from. If we're talking about three very high level, very established contractors that we all know, then I then their bids are going to be accurate. You can trust that a little bit more. But if it's kind of like random people, which is what usually happens, you go with one that is kind of a random person. You go with one that your friends suggested, one the architect suggested. And in all those cases, again, very likely the architect's suggested contractor is going to be higher. It could be, again, that they are just higher and more expensive, but most likely it's because they're the most thorough. So that's your problem with competitive bidding is that a lot of time the client is just going to look at the, the number. overall number to make the decision rather than like, again, how did they come up with that number? Who are they? You know, what are the things that they had questions on or suggestions on? Yeah, and I get it because the, that, the number is always the thing that stands out in everyone's mind as the big, bold, fat yeah. text that jumps off the page and that's all you see in your kind of vision of these contracts like man this person's another five hundred thousand dollars and more what the heck like well this one was okay and they're cheaper by x amount i think we can go that route and be okay and uh, another kind of words of wisdom is that and i've said before on the show that almost every client thinks that they're going to be that lucky one person who's going to get through the process with some some shortcuts here and there. We'll go with the contractor who's le a little bit less experienced and cheaper, and I, but I think it's going to work out okay. No, but it never works that way. <laughs> I mean, if works. you want the project to turn out well and, and make some savings where it makes sense and see how everything turns out well, you just need to have the right team. Yeah. You have to have the right team. You have to have open conversation. You have to trust each other. You have to understand the numbers. You have to have people talk about the numbers and see like how you can move things around. Like it's about being smart. It's not about like cutting corners. Yeah. You know, every single project that we've onboarded or we've heard of who had issues where when people were trying to do things, you know, they're trying to change the system, but no, you can't do that. It's one of the great things about what we do and why one of the reasons why we enjoy it, but it's also the challenging thing is that almost every step you take in the architecture and construction process needs to be taken correctly. It only takes one or two missteps for things to go very sideways. So um, it, it, you have to be very vigilant is what that means. Yeah. Going back real quick to the first point of, you know, this, the, that it's crazy to do all this work and then bid it out and find out that's too expensive. The thing that happens in those cases, again, you don't really have much choice but then to redesign. So now you're spending more money on the architect, on us, to redesign things to meet this, to meet your actual budget. And that's very, very wasteful. I mean, you're just spending time, more time and money. The other big negative about the the competitive bidding process, which you talk, which you mentioned, is from the contractor side. It is extremely difficult for a contractor, even the most experienced high level contractor in the world. It's very difficult for them to come into a project a year after it's already been going and understand what they need to do. I'm not just talking about um, their capacity to read the document set, the, the pricing set and be thorough with it. Even if they're good at those things, it's not enough because what happens with these projects, which, which lasts you know, a couple years or maybe even more, is over time, there's this kind of meta knowledge that gets built up and a kind of implicit understanding of the client, of, of who you are and what you want and your motives, and also the project, right? And 
as the architect, if we've worked with you for a year or the better part of a year producing these drawings and this design, we know you very well. We understand the project very well. We understand that meta information and where we're going. The contractor does not. It's brand new for them. And so th this is another point is contractors really hate competitive building. And in fact, a lot of the high level ones we know, they won't do it because it's just too difficult. If, uh, the, the cost of doing the estimate for sure, but also jumping into a project partway through and being fully responsible for, in some ways, the most important aspect of it. It's, um, you know, it's kind of an impossible task. So in summary, competitive bidding sounds like a great idea, but I think it does have its, 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 uh, its negatives. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the third way of engaging with a contractor, which is different from the others, is design build. Um, we're not going to go into great depth and details to what design built is and the pros and cons. We'll do that in another recording, but just give us an overview as to what design build means. Well, design build, as it sounds, is that you hire the same person, the same office, the same entity to do both design and the construction aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time, these offices would have, you know, architects, designers, part of their team. And then, of course, a contractor, subcontractor is part of their team. So the idea is that you could design a project in a more efficient way, basically knowing construction techniques, cost of things from the get-go. Mm. So you don't over-design or you don't overspend in the budget, you know, with the way you're designing and then get the, the price tag shock after the design is done. You kind of like do both kind of intertwined, you know, throughout the process. Ideally, um, the, I know I said we were going to talk about it, but we'll, we'll, real briefly, there are significant downsides to quote design build. First of all, the vast, vast majority of design to build companies are not what I would consider or anyone would consider proper designed build, design build companies. They're mostly contractors who have some very low level designers in the office and uh, they're not licensed architects. <laughs> like 95% of the time, they're not licensed architects. And the other issue with design build is there's some, a lot of times a lack of transparency, the complete opposite of what you would want and expect from design build, which is, the detailed transparency with the, uh, of the cost of things that you mentioned. Because everything's lumped into one kind of bucket, um, it tends to be, especially at the mid or lower tiers of construction, that it, you just get one number and like that's the number. Yeah, and what's attractive for clients a lot of times who go that route is that they're thinking, while well, I'm getting this number for both the design fee and the construction, Mm -hmm. So it's all like in one, you know, in the same bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and well, you know, it sounds pretty good. And, and actually, if they show you the details, oftentimes the design fee is peanuts compared to the rest of the number. Uh, lower than it should be. Lower than it should be. And that's appealing to clients because it's like, well, I don't need to pay an architect, you know, a lot of money to get to get it done. These guys would do it for like much cheaper. Well, yeah, but it's... <laughs> it, it, it tends to be that with the arc, the service that architects provide and what we charge and the same thing for contractors, it's kind of like within the tier that you're in, um, the numbers are the numbers. There's, there's not really an easy way for us to just, like in our case, for example, like chop our fee in half and provide the same services. It's not... It's not possible. Same thing for the contractor. You know, you can tell, con well, can't you lower the price by whatever percentage? And they're probably going to say most often, how? How? I mean, I can reduce my profit by a little bit, but that's not going to make a huge dent. I can't source, I can't, you know, create wood out of air. <laughs> like, I have to source the materials and this is the cost of labor. Um, so, so anyway, I don't know how we got on that, but but the yeah, that's the issue with design build is that the, the, the lack of transparency. So, um, there's, there's, there's really only a very few select offices, a design build companies and offices who do it properly, where they have that business model to be profitable and more lucrative. Yes. But also because it helps them produce very high quality products and houses. There's very, very few that do that. The majority of them, they do it because it's a more lucrative business model period yeah they just use the design aspect to kind of like you know lure in yeah. uh, clients yeah and and actually the final product might be built decently but it might not be super interesting in terms of design yeah so. yeah so that that's the third one um the fourth one which i mentioned at the beginning is pre-construction and pre-construction <clears throat> is technically a, a a phase or a type of service that contractors provide before construction starts 
it has several benefits and it's sort of like a, a merging of, of, of the different methods that we've already described. But basically the way that we utilize pre-construction is that we engage with and, and hire a contractor just for pre-construction services. We, I mean, the client would hire them, but we bring the contractor on board. The client hires the contractor for pre-construction services. So we start with the contractor ideally from day zero. I don't want to work my ideal process is to not work on a project unless there's a contract of a good contractor on board from the very beginning. So one of so two of the main advantages of going with a pre-con services route is that really you get, you know, a, a contractor on board from the, from the get-go that can provide you estimates at, at key points of the design just mm -hmm. so you make sure that we're not going off board with the budget, we're staying on track. Um, and even sometimes make suggestions to save money here and there, depending on, you know, like what kind of ideas they can have. The other thing is that they could be also extremely important to to have to give uh, constructability feedbacks. Mm. They might have some input as to like, you know, specifications, things to use, where to get stuff, like all kinds of things that they're, you know, they're really knowledgeable on. And that or could the assembly benefit. of like complex things that could yeah, be Yeah, the fabrication of things that, you know, maybe are a bit unusual. Mm -hmm. um, they might already think about, you know, sometimes you see cool houses and they have like this very unique, I don't know, like stair or whatever that's never been done before, yeah. where somebody has to figure out how we're going to build this thing, how we're going <laughs> to bring it in, in the house when the walls it. are built, right? Yeah. Um, so it's important to have a, a guy like this on board from, or a guy or girl like this on board from the beginning because it might take them months to kind of like think about how we're going to bring that, how we're going to put that together. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult to ask somebody after your CDs are done and be like, okay, now construction starts, figure it out. Yeah, no. And um, it's a much more collaborative way of working. Um, I, I do want to be clear though, that because we engage with the contractor from day zero, it doesn't mean that they were they are as much involved and as consistently involved throughout the design and documentation phases as the architect. That's for sure not the case. No, they're usually the hired for do spray con services are usually more like a like a consultant. Yeah. You know, yep, someone basically. we would reach out like, okay, you know, now we're wrapping up this phase. Can you look at it? Can we have a meeting and kind of like you know, give you a run of where we're at. The pre-construction services doesn't mean that that specific contractor is going to be awarded the job at the end. So that's something to be very, very clear of. Uh, you can consult with a contractor throughout the design phases and then decide to go with someone else. Now I have to say, it's not cool because, you know, this guy has been putting the time and effort. It's probably not smart because the guy who's doing the pre-con services knows the project really well by the time it's ready to get built. So yeah. you probably want to stay with that person, honestly. Pre-construction services are they all are they are also not offered by all contractors. So there's there's no sure you know there's no rule uh, and no 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 um, concrete tests to to decide which is a good contractor versus bad. But I will say that again the high level ones the ones that are really good most of them offer pre-con because they like it and it, it it just makes sense. The ones that are kind of mid to lower level generally don't right. Uh, because they don't, they don't, they don't care to do that. They'd rather just bid on it and do it or not do it. Um, but when a contractor is offering pre-construction services, you are paying for it. It's not a free service. No, it's not. It makes sense. It's 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 work. Yeah, and the cost is again relatively small compared to the total cost of the project. Um, some people, again, they look at it like, well, do I need to do this? Can we just kind of get by without it? It's like you you could. It's going to increase your chances uh, of risk and problems. So again, it goes back to the larger philosophy of spend a little bit of money and time now to secure the future. And that's what we're doing. And you know, we're not talking about projects that are like kitchen remodels. You probably don't need pre-con for that. But like, you know, a larger size, more complex project, yeah. you can definitely benefit from having an expert that's consulting throughout the design process. Um, to get you to a good place to start construction. I would still advocate for using um, pre-construction services, uh, maybe for a single, a single kitchen remodel. It's not necessary. Although it depends on the kitchen uh, also. But but for sure, like a gut remodel, a gut interior remodel, or a significant architecture addition, I would still do it. Because why not? Because why not? Um, I also think that the 
the oh yeah so so how contractors charge for these services varies from 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 one to the other sometimes it's a fixed fee sometimes it's hourly sometimes it's a, a monthly kind of retainer uh, and that's how it's broken down uh, other times it's a percentage of the construction and in some cases also what they'll do is they will eat that pre-construction fee in the end so uh, if they, they make, get awarded if the they job. get awarded the project exactly yeah. so let's say it costs you fifteen thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars or whatever it is you'll, I guess, essentially get a $20,000 $20, discount if you go with that contractor. The other benefit of pre-construction for the client is that it allows you to basically have in an elongated interview of that contractor to see how well you work with them. It's a test run. It's you a know, test it's run. A, you're hiring someone for a very specific task. You're not tied to them past that point. It's very clear what their scope of services is. And if you don't like them or they don't like you, well, you're each free to go your own ways. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you would rather want to be doing that before construction starts, not in the, not in the middle of it. Uh, no, for sure. Um, and it, we were talking about the, we used the word collaboration a minute ago, and we were talking about how we would engage with the contractor and how often throughout the process. And I, I do like your idea, the, the, the word of consultant. Um, because it means that they're they're not there all the time, um, but that there's an open line of communication. And frankly, this is the approach we prefer to have with all of the professionals on the project, even the engineer, which as, as a brief aside, again, historically, engineers are brought on a little bit later in the project. Once you have, quote, the design figured out, then you have an engineer and you say, okay, engineer, how do we support this thing that I've created? Yeah. Uh, which just doesn't make sense to me for, again, cost, design, uh, efficiency, schedule, all of those reasons. Um, so um, as a general, having everyone on board from from day zero is very helpful. Again, it doesn't mean that as a client, you're paying everyone full time that entire process. On the specific subject of getting cost estimates throughout. So it um, how that works, again, varies on the project and the offices. The way we typically do it is the very first phone call I have with a new client. And during that phone call, a lot of times it's just me. There's no contractor involved. We will use uh, a construction cost per square foot as a way to gauge very, very, very roughly the feasibility of whatever this thing there, it is that they're trying to do. Any contractor and any architect will tell you that the cost per square foot way of understanding things is a terrible way to estimate because it's, it's just too broad and too vague right but if we're just having a very initial conversation and there's been no drawings i don't know the site i don't know anything and you know in, in detail it's not a bad way to estimate things because if someone says to me i have a hillside property in la or in the bay area or somewhere in california where things are expensive um it's very steep. There's a bunch of trees or whatever else. I want it to be this exquisite home and my budget is this amount and I run numbers, you know, on my calculator and I realize, okay, you're talking about $400 a square foot. I will say, there's no way. It's not possible for what you're trying to achieve. And I can tell in that first conversation, you know, again, very in a ballpark sense, if it's good or if it's not. Um, Obviously, as we move throughout design and we're using the contractor for estimates, the estimates and the numbers become more and more accurate um, as we go throughout. And, and that's how we like to do it. Um, it. It is one of the reasons why not all contractors do pre-construction and do estimates is because it's really, really difficult for a person whose business and probably their personality is to be hyper thorough and detailed about the cost of every little thing to just give like a ballpark. Uh, a lot of contractors really hate doing that because it's it's like, well, I'm going to give you this number, but it could be off. And if I'm off, you, the client, you're going to come back to me and, and be upset and say, why did you tell me it was going to be this amount when it ended up costing another 25% more? What is the problem with estimates is that a lot of times people take those numbers as it is. It, as that the is, fixed That number. is it. Yeah. And estimates are estimates. You are guessing <laughs> as close as you can. Yeah. It is not it. Yes. So if you are a client and you are fortunate enough to have a contractor who is willing to provide estimates throughout and, and you know, hopefully you're paying them to do that, do you have to have to keep in mind that that until it comes for the final price based on the construction documents, um, until that point, 
they're all just estimates by by varying degrees and the contractor will, will obviously emphasize this also as much as they can um to set expectations um because things can vary greatly just with materials so some client could also wonder sometimes like, well, how could you provide estimates if we don't have all the information on the design? Like yeah. we don't know what paint we're using, you know, what door hardware, what window type, like the window brand, materials. like the specificity of each item, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you give as much information as you have. And if you don't have things specified in those greater details, what you do for estimates is that you, you ask the contractor to basically price out what we call allowances. Um, which I don't know. Well, like, well, you know, for the facade, we're thinking like a stucco doesn't need to know exactly what color stucco, what texture stucco, stucco, and that gives them an idea. Or it's about like, you know, finishes in the bathroom. Well, you know, we're looking probably at slabs, like marble slabs, mm -hmm. not quartz, not tile, you know, so that gives you an idea. Um, faucets, you know, there's a huge range. You can buy a faucet for 10 bucks and you can buy one for 20,000. 20, so you kind of like give them maybe a name of a couple brands that could also help them yep. figure out their allowances. And you want the allowances to be like close enough to what you're thinking the, the final specification would be like, because the goal is not to like have allowances that are huge if they're like disproportionate to what things are going to be. You want them to be semi accurate. Yeah, it's it, allowances are critical. It's something we do very often, and any you know experienced architect and builder will have a set and a, a, a database of that in their mind. Okay, it's this kind of project. I understand the client. I understand the budget. We're going to specify as an allowance this specific material, um, and it's always way better to have that line item with an allowance than just or, or and at the very least having it listed with a with a blank as opposed to not listing it at all. Yeah, because that's when you get into trouble. When, when things are not listed and then there's a number, then you realize you're missing stuff or someone said, oh, yeah, it's there, but sort of there, not there, but it's accounted for. That squishy zone, we want to avoid that as much as possible. So I think allowances are very important. And even for the structural portion of the house, which is trickier. So on every project, there's a structural engineer and they're the person who engineers and designs the structure, which supports the house and holds it up, which is different from what architects do. Um, f depending on, depending on the site and depending on the project and the design, the contractor, when they're producing their estimates will also say like, I need to have some understanding of what the structure is going to cost. Because I think as you alluded to earlier, uh, if it's on a hillside, the foundation to the foundation alone could be a quarter of a million dollars or more. And that's a sizable part of the budget. So that's also why we like having the, the engineer on board the project early on so they can provide preliminary kind of schematic uh, engineering, um, not drawing sets, it could be a drawing set or sketches or something, something to work with. So we're not leaving it totally blank. Yeah, is it like old wood frame? Do we have like a huge steel beam because we're trying to have this cantilever thing or this giant glass opening and we need to support the second floor and like, you know, it it that could really uh, substantially impact the construction costs. Yeah, yeah. And it is tricky with these projects because you know let's say you're getting a uh it, well the early phases you know the, the the cost per square foot would be considered a rough order of magnitude and rom but then later on the project maybe like toward the end of s schematic design or even early design development you want to get another estimate of some kind where do you draw the line in terms of how much work do we and the engineer and other people produce to get a a somewhat accurate estimate that's a fuzzy thing right and the answer to that can't really be answered on, on here. It varies greatly from project to project and from engineer to engineer and from team to team as to how you're going to do it. Sometimes it's just a, a, a physical like sketch the engineer does or someone does and says, this is roughly what we're considering. And other times they're more detailed with it. It varies. So pre-construction, I think it's something that is a pretty good idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so, Honestly. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea. I think it's being more and more common these days, and I think it makes sense. Um, and if you've never heard about it, then I think being aware of it is good. And asking the contractors that maybe you're thinking of using, or you know, you got recommended 
they'll be interested in providing those services um, and expect to pay for them That's, and expect to pay yeah. for them i mean it is their time like it takes time. The, you know, like like any other profession, like unless you're running a nonprofit, and even if you are, like your time is still important and and billable. So it, 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 it makes sense. I also think that if you are getting free estimates, sort of as a favor, like the contractor says, okay, yeah, I'll give you an estimate here or there. The the quality of the estimates probably not going to be super great, and their patience is going to run out pretty quickly. Yeah, and you know, if they're doing pre-construction services, even if they're paid for those services, that probably means that at the end they're interested in doing the construction for this project. They wouldn't just do a bunch of pre-construction no. services for a, a, you know dozens of projects and never get to build them. Like, yeah. I think you know you, you, their motivation is pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, and I think it usually means that they're they're more likely to be legit uh, yeah. than not. All right, if you have any questions about any of the stuff we talked about, the different uh, ways you can hire a contractor and when to engage them and the pros and cons or whatever else, feel free to reach out to us. Well, thank you everybody for listening to this Project Companion episode. If you are looking for more advice before maybe you start your own project, you can go to our website, secondstudiopod.com and click on the category Project Companion. You'll see there is a, a lot more episodes out there that uh, we've recorded. If you like the show, please share it with your friends, your family, anybody you know um, that you think could benefit from, from those types of episodes. And of course, leave us a review. That's always the best way to support the show. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much any other podcast platform. Podcast is also on Instagram. That's the main platform that the podcast is on. And uh, you can find us. You can find us there. You can find us everywhere. The, the show has a hotline, which is 213-222-6950. So you can text questions or leave voicemails. And you can also reach out to us through our office, uh, which is FAME. Any of those places, we're around to help.